Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James Ophir here with you. So glad you are with us tonight. Welcome to the program. And we're going to be discussing a topic that you may not know. We're going to be discussing something that you have that you may not know you have. And uh, so hopefully that will pique your interest and we're going to be getting into that lesson momentarily. But but first, we want to start by giving you our content information, 276-340-2653, 276-340-2653 is how you can reach me. That's my cell number, a word from the Lord at gmail.com. A word from the Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me by email. And of course, we want you to uh, always remember as a mascot up there on the screen, a uh, word from the Lord radio program. It's a live calling program on Sunday afternoons at 5 p.m. Uh, on uh, uh, 1490. Locally, it's 1490 and 1420 a.m. or online at uh, rcr24.com. That's Rockingham County Radio. Uh, it's a live stream, so you can listen to that live. Uh, YouTube, all archives. You can just go to uh, uh, James Oldfield, a word from the Lord, and you can find their uh, archive videos, lessons uh, as well. So we hope that you will take advantage of that. We'll say more about that uh, program uh, at the end of the at the end of this lesson, but we hope that you will remember this. Uh, Rockingham County Radio RCR24.com. You can download the app, put it on your smartphone, your tablet, whatever. Listen to it on the go, and so I uh, uh, hope you will take advantage of that uh, Sunday afternoons, 5 p.m. live call in, and uh, there's the numbers on the screen. We'll put them up for you again uh, later on, so you can write those down and be ready to call in on Sunday. Well, as I said, tonight we're going to be discussing something that everybody has, even though you may not know it. And what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about your own personal God. You say, well, James, I don't have a personal God. I don't have little figurines, little fat men that I rub their bellies and stuff like that. Well, you may not have gods like that, but I know people have different gods. They have their own personal gods because I hear them call to their personal gods. I hear them call them out. You know, they, you know, they'll something exciting and they'll go, OMG. Now friends, the reason why I know that's not the God of the Bible and that's their own personal God is because the God of the Bible, you don't, you don't take his name in vain. And people that would serve him don't, don't exclaim his name flippantly. They don't, they don't use his name in vain. And so, they have to be talking about their own personal gods. Now, let me ask, let me ask you this. What is a god? <clears throat> what does it mean? Well, the word theos means a supreme being or authority, an all-powerful one. And everybody has their own god or gods. And you say, well, I, I, like I said, I don't have all those. Well, you do. Whatever's the greatest thing in your life, whatever's the most important thing in your life, that's, that's your god. And again, when you, when you start realizing that you serve this thing or things, when you realize that this is what's all important in your life, all authoritative, the, with everything you live for, that's your God. That becomes your God. And so you might say, well, I worship the, I worship the God of the Bible. Well, if that's the case, then why do you have all these other gods that, that are clouding up your life? We'll get into that in just a moment. See, friends, everybody has a God. Everybody has their own God. Now, I want you to notice when people have their own gods, they're always going to wind up uh, pitting their gods against a true and living God. And it may be the case that you are doing this very thing. Let me give you an example. In, in Exodus, in Exodus 5 and verse 2, we find Pharaoh's gods are competing against the God of the Bible, the true and living God. In Exodus 5 and verse 2, the Bible says, And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go. I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. So Pharaoh said, you know, I don't know this God. I'm not going to listen to him. I'm going to listen to my own gods. And you'll recall that what he did was he called in his magicians and whenever <clears throat> Moses would uh, um, throw his rod down and it turned to serpent. Well, they threw their rods down and it turned to serpent and Moses' rod swallowed theirs up. And whenever they, uh, whenever Moses turned the water to blood, they did the same thing too. And so as, as time went on, they eventually couldn't do the things that Moses was doing, but it was enough 
that his magicians were hardening his heart, thinking that his God was just as good as their God. Thinking that his God, the God of the Egyptians, was just as good as Moses' God. And so I'm saying, you start finding these gods compared to the true and living God. And the honest person, when they start realizing, you know what, these, these false gods or the God that I'm serving is not really the true and living God, the God that we read about in the Bible, then they'll change. Now notice an example. When you start comparing some things that the true and living God can do, he will do and he will say things that is unlike any other God. Now notice, compare Pharaoh's reaction to to God compared to Jethro. This is Moses' father-in-law. In Exodus chapter 18, verses 10 and 11, <clears throat> the children of Israel have come out of uh, Egypt. They've crossed the Red Sea. Uh, the Red Sea has destroyed all the Egyptians' army, and they've gone, uh, you know, they're, 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 uh, now they're in the desert, and here comes Jethro. This is Moses' father-in-law. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord, who hath delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of, all, and out of the hand of Pharaoh, who hath delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now notice, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. Now the Bible says that he was a priest of Midian. And so this is what we're talking about. Even then he was still skeptical about God compared to all the other gods. But now he's come to realization. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. From the thing wherein thou dealt proudly, he was above them. See, friends, when you start looking at the Bible, and you start looking at the God of the Bible, you will, you will soon see, if you're honest, that the God of the Bible is greater than all gods. But that doesn't keep people from having their own gods. That doesn't keep people from saying, well, I'll believe in this God, but I'm also going to believe in this God. Now, how do I know people say that? Because, friends, there's people who believe that God is in nature, and therefore they have the nature God. They have God that is in, 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 uh, uh, in all things or living things, and so nature is their God. Nature is their God. In, in Romans 1, verse 25, uh, Paul says, Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. You know, there's individuals that would actually worship the creation, and not even recognize that there is a creator. You think about it. You got all these tree huggers out here. Let's don't kill this plant. Let's don't kill this. Let's don't harm this animal. Let's don't do anything because we are bad people. We're humans. We're bad. And the planet is what we need to uh, 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 preserve. And we should just die off. Now, friends, I'm not. I'm not opposed to, to uh, conservation. I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to you know, using your resources wisely. I, I don't advocate going here and just cutting all the trees down. I, I'm not that kind of person. But I'm just saying, the idea that creation is more important than the, than the creator has, has confused so many people. They actually stop looking at the one who created everything and they make the creation a God in themselves. They worship it. They worship it. Now, how do I know that? Well, think about this way. When you have individuals like atheists or agnostics, agnostics, they, they don't want to admit there's a God. They don't believe there's a God. They say they don't know if there's a God. An atheist means there's no God. Ah, theos. That's, that's anti-God, no God. Are agnostics. A is, is, is no and Gnostics is no. A is N-O and Gnostic is K-N-O-W. So they said there, there's, there's no knowing. Now friends, when individuals deny the Almighty God, the God you read about in the Bible, and then in place of that put science in place of that, they've created their own God, their own, their own religion, you might say. Now, we know, we know, according to the Bible, when you look at the Bible, the Bible does not contradict science, not true science. It doesn't contradict true science. It'll, it'll contradict <coughs> science uh, falsely so-called or so-called science, as Paul says, <coughs> but true science and the Bible go hand in hand. They harmonize beautifully. 
harmonized beautifully. Why? Because the God that created the heavens and the earth is the same God that created science or knowledge and created all the things of scientific facts that men have come along and discovered. God already knew them, and many of them you find in the Bible. And I know there's been uh, times when we've talked about things on, on this program and other programs where we're, we're discussing we're discussing the, uh, uh, the scientific facts that are in the Bible, like the paths of the sea, Psalm 8, uh, where uh, uh, Matthew uh, F- Fontaine Murray, he, uh, he you know, read about the paths of the sea and he discovered that, yeah, there's currents. And you can, you can look at uh, uh, globes now or, or world patterns or, or what am I trying to say, satellite images, and you can actually see the, the currents going through the ocean, or the, the jet streams that are going around the world. Well, Solomon talks about that, the water cycle and the wind cycle. These are all things that are in the Bible that men came along and discovered later on, hey, it's true. The Bible says that the earth is round. He uh, set it upon the circle, the circle of the earth, Isaiah says. Sure, the earth is round. Uh, he hangs it upon nothing. There's an empty place over the north. Yeah, there's no stars in the north. How does Isaiah know that? Well, see, so this is what we're talking about. True science goes hand in hand with God. But, but friends, when individuals reject God, the true and living God, they will always sub- substitute their own. Now, here's a good example. This is Larry Serber. And uh, uh, listen to what he says about nature. See, he thinks nature is God. Listen to what he says and how he actually substitutes that for the true and living God. And this is typical? Uh, Everything is part of nature. There's nothing outside of nature. There's no supernatural. There's no ghosts. There are no gods, no devils, no witches, no demons. As far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned, I've never seen a, a bit of evidence for that. Just because we don't understand something doesn't mean that we have to explain it with some anthropomorphic view of something like a man, if you don't understand how an internal combustion engine in a car works, that does not mean that you have to say that, well, that car goes down the street because an invisible God is blowing it down the street with his breath. Years ago, people thought the sun went across the sky. It doesn't. It appears to. It looks like it comes up over in the east and is more or less overhead at noon and then goes down in the west. That doesn't happen. We now know, using science and math, that the earth turns, the sun doesn't go across the sky. But back when people thought it did go across the sky, their explanation was it went across the sky because a god, a special god, the sun god, carried it across the sky every day in his chariot. To me, that's childish. And and again, it's anthropomorphic. It's nature acting like like a man. All right, so here's, here's the atheist saying, you know, just because you don't know, know, understand something, you don't attribute it to a God. And as far as he's concerned, there's nothing more than nature. Well, as far as he's concerned, as far as he wanted to be concerned. But see, friends, I want you to see something. This is typical about what people do. When they don't want to acknowledge the true and living God, they will always substitute another God. Listen again to what he has to say. In fact, I think subjective morality is superior because it comes from your conscience. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Feel missing a point. I know you don't want to see them suffer and you don't want to make them suffer. But what if someone else over here does want to make them but suffer? they evil people. How, by, why are you calling them evil? Why are you calling them evil? Why are you calling them evil? Because they make humans suffer. They but make sir, suffer. You, can't, you can't give me a reason why making someone suffer is wrong. Yes, I can. By what standard? By my standard. I don't want okay, to Okay, that's what I'm saying, sir. Standard. That's my whole point. By what standard? By my standard. By what standard? By my standard. In fact, I think subjective morality is superior because it comes from your conscience. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, you see what it did? This is typical. We want to dismiss the true God and we want to substitute the creation, in this case, a man, as God. And this is what all atheist agnostics want to do. They want to substitute and be their own God. Get rid of the God of the Bible because we don't want him to be in our lives because if he is real, if there is really a, a, a living 
being that is greater than all of us, then we have to submit to him, and we don't want that. We want to be our own God. And that's exactly what Larry actually admitted later on. Here's what I'm he said. I'm saying I come from a point where, yes, it's wrong, but not because I think it's wrong. See, I don't want people to come to my standard. I want them to come to a standard that's not mine. I do want people to come to my standard. But, but, yes. But, 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 sell. but your standard is not good enough for, for me. Even. I do want people to come to my standard. I do want people to come to my stand. I do want people to come to my stand. I do want people to come to my stand. All right. So there you have it. The creation is now God. Everybody has their own gods. And you're saying, well, James, I don't, I I don't, that's not, that's not my God. I don't, I don't have a God like that. Friends, if you are not obeying the gospel, if you hadn't obeyed the gospel, and if you haven't submitted to the God who wrote this book and who has given us the Bible, then really, you are just like him. You have your own God. You are doing your own thing, saying your own thing, doing your own thing, and not really concerned about what God says. So the God of your life is really competing with the God of the Bible, the true God. See how it works? Everybody has a God, and everybody is going to be uh, fighting with the true God, with the true God. Everybody has that God. Now I want you to notice. Let's notice in Luke 12. In Luke 12, verses 16 through 21. Now this is a parable that Jesus spake about a rich man. And it says, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought with himself, saying, What shall I do? And he said, This is what I'll do. I'll pull down my barns and build bigger barns. Now, what are we talking about? I'm talking about the God of the pleasure of this life. Greed. The idea that people just want more and more. You don't think that's somebody's God? You don't think that's somebody's God? Somebody is worshiping this God by saying, you know what, I just have to have more. I just have to have more and more and more. Jesus went on to say, Jesus went on to say, he said, I will say to my soul, self, sorry about that, I'm getting... I will say to my soul, uh, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Now, so he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. See that? The God of the pleasure of this life is always going to be competing with the God of this world. Now, when you think, people say, well, God wants me to be rich. You think about this, friends. These folks on TV that are, are advocating this name it, claim it, you know, this prosperity gospel, this health and wealth. See what they're doing? They're telling you that the true and living God really wants you to amass all this wealth. He wants you to be happy by by accruing all of this abundance of, of things. When Jesus clearly said in Luke 12, let's just look at this, in Luke 12, here's what he said right before he gave this parable. He said, Take heed, beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. The warning that he gave was, Don't get consumed with all the stuff. And yet, what do people do? They say, well, you know, I'm going to serve the God of of stuff. I want to serve the God of covetousness. I'm going to serve the God of greed. I'm going to serve the God of get everything I want. Now, friends, that's exactly what we're talking about. You see how the God of of, of this world, it's what Paul calls uh, the devil in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, has convinced people that there is a better God to serve, they're serving their own belly. Look at this. In, uh, in Philippians, Philippians 3 and verse 18. Who do you think, who do you think is the God here? For many walk, of whom I have told you often, now I tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. You mean to tell me that the God that you read about in the Bible, 
the God who sent his only son to die for our sins, the God who has promised us hope of eternal life if we're obedient to him is the same God that people are serving when they amass great wealth just for the sake of getting rich more and more. When Jesus said, when, well, excuse me, when Paul said, notice in um, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10, he said, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through many sorrows. This is the God you're serving. This is the God you're serving. He says, but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Notice, come on down. Come on down to verse uh, uh, 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. This God, the God of riches and the cares of this world and the pleasure of this life, it's not the same. It's not the same as the true and living God. And you know what? There's a lot of individuals, I'm talking about members of the Lord's church, that will spend all of their time trying to get more and more and more wealth, trying to climb the ladder of success, to have bigger houses, nicer cars, than, nicer than anybody else on the block, or keeping up with the Joneses, trying to have everything everybody else has. They'll spend their time seeking serving this God and not the true and living God. Now, you can say, well, I don't have a God other than the true and living God. Oh, yeah, you do. And you know what? Your preacher does too. Your preacher serves the God of his belly. The preacher serves the God of, of, of give me stuff. The give me, give me, give me God. How do I know that? Think about this. Is your pastor like Paul? Listen to what Paul said. Paul said, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 15 through 18. You think about all the things that Paul went through for the Corinthians. I will spend and be spent for you. He spent time and time and time and time and time trying to get these brethren on the right track. Time and time again, he was writing to them, correcting them, encouraging them. And, and this is for what? Paul was beaten, left for dead, robbed, in shipwreck, all of this for the cares of the Corinthians and other Christians. Do you think your pastor's like that? Do you really think your pastor's like that? Does your pastor, would, would he say that his care is about you and you only? Here's what Paul said about Timothy. Paul said, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you, for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. They all seek their own. They're not concerned about you. Now, friends, who, who's, who's God, who, what God are they really serving? When they, say, when they say OMG, yeah, they're talking about their own personal God. They're not talking about the true and living God. They're talking about their own God, the God of their belly, the God of pleasure, the God of this life, that that's who they're serving. Think about it. When you've got guys that are living in houses like this, driving these big old Bentleys, who are they seeking? Who are they seeking to, to please? What is he seeking to please? He's not worshiping God. See how this works? See how this works? So I'm just saying, who's your God? Who is your God that you're serving? You know, there's some people that serve the God of praise of men. The praise of men God. Now, what does he look like? Well, you know, I, I'm sure that uh, if Paul was on Mars Hill and he saw all these inscriptions to the unknown gods, he might not have seen a god like this, but there's folks today that worship this god. They, they worship the praise of men God. In John 12, verse 42 and 43, here's what the Bible says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogues. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now friends, is that your God? Are you, are you worshiping the praise of men, God? There's a lot of individuals that they bow down to this God. They love the praise of men. They, they, they just love to be seen. 
They love to be invited to speak and love to be acknowledged and all in front of big crowds. I'm talking about in the Lord's church too. Yeah, they love the praise of men. They go to lectureships and write books and they want to be known and pat on the back because they got doctorates and PhDs and LMOPs and everything else after their name. Yeah, they want the praise of men. I've been there. Somebody gets up and goes, all the preachers stand up and we give y'all a big hand. We had a funeral. And you want somebody to acknowledge you? Listen, you, you, you can sit on down because one day you'll be in that casket and, and everybody be talking about you. Your day will come. Just, just take the time. What are you doing seeking the praise of men? See? Now, if you don't seek the praise of men, or if your pastor is not worshiping the God of praise of men, the praise of men God, why is he insisting on being called reverend? Why, is he, why does he insist on being called reverend? Friends, I really wish you would stop and think about this. Uh, because what we're dealing with, what we're dealing with is, is a, a man who has his own God complex. Do you know that? Dealing with a man who has a God complex. If he's going to be called reverend, he's taking the name of God. Now, is that really where, is that who you're worshiping? When you call a man reverend, you're calling him God. Oh, now don't, t don't tell me you're serving this God. Don't tell me you're serving this God, because I guarantee you this God is the one who's called reverend. And he looks nothing like your God. He looks nothing like that guy that comes in and you that you call reverend. Who, who's God are they serving? See? Who, who's the God that's being served here? It's the, it's the praise of man God. Men who want to be like God. In Matthew 23, Matthew 23, listen to what Jesus says. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their little fingers. And he said, And all their works they do, for to be seen of men, they make broad their phylacteries, and enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms at feast, and chief seats in the synagogue, and greetings in the marketplace to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and ye are all brethren. And call no man father upon the earth, for, uh, for one is your father which is in heaven. And yet, what do we do? We've got all you folks out there in the Catholic Church, all your friends out there in the Catholic Church, they're going, oh, Papa, Papa, Papa John, Papa John. Papa Francis. Papa John's a pizza. But that's what you call him. You call him Pope. That's Papa. Daddy. He's your daddy. Papa John. Papa Francis. Papa, Papa Paul. See what you're doing? You're, you're calling him your daddy. Your father. Chief apostle of the world. Reverend. Holy Reverend. Holy right Reverend. What are you doing? You're elevating yourself up to a place of God. Jesus said, you're all brethren. Now why is it, why is it in the religious world we're told that, oh, we're all one, we're all one, we're all, we all have unity, we're all the same in God, but yet you've got reverend, bishop, right bishop, first bishop, elder bishop, elder pastor, deacon bishop. I don't know what they call themselves. They've got all these names that don't even know what the word means. And they're doing it to elevate themselves. See who? That's the God they're serving. That's the God they're serving. They're not wanting to be elevated like God uh, by, by God's standard. They want to elevate it, be elevated by men. Notice this. Here's a, here's a good example of what uh, men try to do. They, this is Balaam and Balak. Balak is the king of, of uh, Moab, and he's called Balaam, and he said, You need to curse Israel, and I will promote you. Look what he said, Numbers 22, verse 37. And Balak said unto Balaam, Did I not earnestly send unto thee to call thee? Wherefore camest 
thou not unto me? Am I not able indeed to promote thee to honor? You, you do what a man says and he'll promote you. You do what a man says, he'll promote you. Number 2411, therefore uh, flee thou to thy place. I thought to promote thee to great honor, but, to the, Lord, but the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. Balak told Balaam, yeah, since you didn't do what I said, God has kept you back. Let me tell you something, friends. If you do what God says, he won't keep you back. Men can only lift you so high. They think to promote you honor and to get you to think that, well, I'll give you some honor. I'll, I'll get honor. I'll give you honor and everybody look up to you. I had a brother say the other day, I hadn't thought about this. Maybe this might be, he might be on something. But he said, you know, he said, I think that a lot of these guys that watch your programs, listen to y'all, listen to us on TV and so forth. He said, when they go and ask their pastors questions, he said, I think what they do is the pastors then give them a position. You can teach here. You can teach over there. You can be a deacon. You can be an usher. We're going to make you the Sunday morning uh, usher on the left side. I don't know what, the, I don't know what they do. But he says, he said, they, they give them a position so they'll quit asking questions. Maybe he's on to something. Maybe he's on to something. But listen, the greatest servants of all serve others, not themselves. So who's your God? See, this is what I'm talking about. Now, there's a lot of different gods, a lot of different gods that are fighting with the true and living God. Many religious gods, like Paul in, uh, um, on Mars Hill in Acts 17, verse 22, he said, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. Friends, that's reverencing God. You, you reverencing all these different gods. You know, I find it interesting that the people that say, I don't want any part of religion, are the very ones that are worshiping a God. They... they it may be themselves, it may be their job, it may be their, their life, it may be whatever, but they've got, their own, they've got their own God. And the people that say, well, it doesn't matter how you worship, this is what they wind up doing. They worship everything except the true and living God. Very superstitious. Many, many gods. Many, many gods like this. The instrumental music God. Friends, when you... When you go against what God said, you wind up worshiping a false God. Now listen, when you try to justify what you're doing, you're ultimately going to say, I'm getting my authority from some other God. Now that may be not what you mean, but that's what you wind up saying. Listen to what this lady says. She's going to, she's going to admit where she's getting her Marching when Paul order. said sing in Ephesians 5.19 or Colossians 3.16, when he said sing, how do you get and play out of that? You don't, you don't, we don't use that kind of, of reasoning Are in everyday life, that do you? Are playing music in a church is wrong? I'm saying if you're worshiping God, God says this is how I want my That's worship. That's my joyful noise. If I choose and my church chooses or whoever's church chooses to play an instrument because that makes them feel good. They're praising the Lord by using that instrument. But I said, my God does not condemn me for praising Him out loud, for clapping my hands, or for playing the piano. I said, my God does not condemn me. I said, my God does not condemn me. I said, my God does not condemn me for praising him out loud, for clapping my hands, or for playing the piano. All right. Her God, her God does not condemn her. Well, her God might not, but the God of the Bible does because the God of the Bible says what he wants. The God of the Bible says, sing and make melody in your heart. That's what he wants. See, friends, this is what we're talking about. This is what God says. Now, you're really listening to God. 
God speaks to us through His Word, and He says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. So when you say, well, my God doesn't condemn me for clapping my hands and making a joyful noise and playing the piano. Well, your God may not, but it's not the same God that wrote this. The God that is okay with whatever you're doing is not the same God that said this. Because the God that said this does not want your hand clapping, humming, jumping, thumping, banging, piano clanging, guitar strumming, banjo picking, hip-hop thumping music. He doesn't want that. He says sing. Now you say, well, my God, well, yeah, your God's right. Your God's right. But it's not, not the God of the Bible. So when you say, well, this is what I want to do, oh, well, go ahead. Your God says it's okay. But don't turn around and tell me you're worshiping the God of the Bible. See, it's, it's, it's strange to me that people will tell you they want you to believe that they're worshiping the God of the Bible, but yet when you ask them where their God says, instrumental music, they, they don't have where, where the God says it. They have to go back to the Old Testament, David playing it. They can't find where God said it in the New Testament. See? And they know they need a God to give them the authority. See? Because God is the supreme being, and so their God, their ultimate authority, is the one that tells them, hey, it's okay. Well, who really told you it's okay? Well, I did. They did. They told themselves that's okay. Now, are you really any different than the atheist over there that's saying, hey, I want everybody to have my standard. I want everybody to do my thing. I want to do what I want to do. You do what you want to do, and we'll just have our own little gods. Yeah. You'll be your own little gods. God to your own self. Little G's. Little G, God, but they're your own gods. They're you. See that? They're you. Now, so, what are we going to do? Are you going to serve the true and living God and do what He says? Or are you going to have your own God? Now, listen. Some people say, well, I don't serve that God. Oh, yes, you do. Yeah, you do. Listen. What about the God of women preacher, the women preacher God? Again, on Mars Hill, I'm, I'm sure if Paul's around today and there was a Mars Hill today, yeah, he'd find, a, he'd find an altar to the to the women preachers God. Because why? Well, because people want to do what they want to do. They're going to do it because that's what they think is right or they think it's okay. It's their opinion. To give everybody an opportunity. Uh, we have a lot of folks, a lot of younger uh, uh, men and women, mm -hmm. you know, and thank God God does use women. Yes, and he does. uses women to preach. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that's scriptural. And uh, we, we just believe in that. Right. God does use women. Yes, and he, he uses women to preach. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that's scriptural. And uh, we, we just believe in that. Right. He got together, heard about a revival down in Danville. A woman, let me say this real good. A woman preacher. Yeah! A woman preacher. Yeah! 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 All right, a woman preacher. Yeah, well, God told him a woman preacher is all right. Yeah, well... His God might have told him that, but the God of the Bible didn't tell, tell that. Look at 1 Timothy 2, verse, verse 12. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 12. This is what one of the things we were, we were discussing on Thursday night. Uh, Paul said, I suffer not a woman to teach nor show authority over men, but to be in silence. All right? You're on the word from the Lord. James. Yes. Uh Play the hymns and you know sing. What verse is that? Uh, I think I had up there I, uh, Ephesians five and verse nineteen. Verse nineteen. Yeah, Ephesians five nineteen. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Yeah, that's the way I was raised up. I, I'm not used to none of that other stuff up in the church. We always had an old hymn book and we sung from that. Right. You know, and we never had a, um, a piano or organ. You go to churches nowadays, they got a full chorus band. Right, right. So where do you, where do you worship now? Um, I'd rather not say. I mean, 
mean, they got kids and everything. They're real good to kids and take care of kids and everything. But I don't have to believe everything they say. Well, why are you there, though? Because, um, I know the difference from right from wrong. If I didn't, I wouldn't be watching you tonight, sir. I, I know, and I, I'm glad you're watching. But I'm saying, why are you there if you know that what they're saying is not right? I don't have, I don't have to listen to everything, sir. Well, I don't, I don't understand why they have these different kind of Bible things, like in game Bible or all this. I'm used to the um, King James Bible, you know. Do you ask them? I don't understand that. Do you ask them? Yes, sir. And what? they just say it's Eng like an English, like an English language or something like that. So, you know? like the. And I can't read that good, so I can't question a whole lot. But what I I see that you're saying is right, and I listen to some of the stuff, and some of the stuff they say is right, but not a lot of it. You know. I mean, well. I'm, and that's what I'm saying. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be taking my kids somewhere if I knew that the stuff, a lot of stuff they're saying is not right, and you're taking your kids there. Well, I, I, he's I mean, a little bit older, I can take him and let him know for himself. Well, I, I, but I don't you never can't keep my son off the street. Okay, but here's the and thing. Here, here's the thing. The Bible says. The Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So what you're doing, you're training up a child in the way that he shouldn't go because you know that what he's being taught is not 100% right, but you're convinced that he's getting enough good that you can stay there. But well, in, the, in the bottom line, you, what you're doing, you're training him up to stay in that church. No, I, we study from the King James Bible three nights a week. Well, you know? So, you know, he'll, that, that, but, he, he ain't but nine years old, just turned nine. He'll read and ask me questions, and I'll read and ask him questions. I'm not um, a pastor or nothing like that. I'm learning and working with him, and he's learning a little bit too. I, I realize that. But, but, but what I'm saying is you're, you're telling him three nights a week of good stuff is okay, and then on Sundays or Wednesdays or wherever... I'm gonna take you and get you some stuff that's not that good. Would you would you feed him poison food two days a week and good food three days a week? Uh, no, sir, I sure don't. All right. So why are you feeding him spiritual food that's that's bad? I don't know if it's because uh, of the people he likes to stare or whatever. You got to realize he's a nine year old kid. I realize that, and there's some nine year old kids that that are smarter than the adults. That's why I'm saying I wouldn't be training him. I wouldn't be training him or teaching him in the in the wrong ways. Why, why would you do that? You definitely right there. He's a whole lot smarter than I am because I have to get him to work my phone for me. But but yeah. you, but what you're telling me is he he's smart enough, but you're going to take him someplace where they're not teaching him truth. Yeah. Uh, that is doesn't that doesn't compute. Well, I, 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 the Bible says. Preaching his own self, and he's nine years old. They let him get up there, and he'll pray, and he'll, you know, he ain't like most people acting. He'll, uh, he'll tell you when he's preaching, he don't preach uh, to help you with something. He don't preach to help me with something. He preaches what God has done. He uh, about um, him letting well, Jesus down on the cross, well, you know, for everything. Right, he but you know what? That's that's world. still. He thanks Jesus for the world and that's the built. And all that, you know. But but see, here's what I'm saying, though. Here's what I'm saying, friend. You're not teaching him right. If he's thanking Jesus for things, the Bible says you pray to God, not Jesus. Jesus said, when you pray, pray our Father which art in heaven. No one said, Jesus never said to say thank you, Jesus, like all these signs I hear say. And I'm, I'm just saying, that's one example, just in the time we've been talking. That's one example how he's being led astray and you're fine with it. Well, I always thought Jesus, God, was the same person. Well, no, they're not the same person. They're, they're all deity, but look, Jesus says in Matthew 6 and verse 9, look what he says. He said, after this man pray, therefore, our Father which art in heaven. Jesus never said, address your prayers to me. He said, address your prayers to the Father. And so when people say, well, thank you, Jesus, you're telling the wrong person thank you. 
But I, you see what I'm saying? But you're letting him, you're letting him believe this lie, and he's going to grow up thinking I'm just going to pray to Jesus. Well, I never was taught any different. I'm just saying you're, you're teaching your kids, you're teaching your kids error, and you know it, and yet you're going to let them stay there. That I, you're not, you're not doing them a good service. The Bible says in Ephesians six. Try, Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Do you call your dad father? My father's dead. Okay, he was your father, right? He was my father. Well, you just said your father was dead. He was my father, my earthly father. I'm talking about in a spiritual in a spiritual sense. Jesus is talking about calling people father. You said he was your father. Okay, so what's your point? What's your point? I mean, you're saying that's the father. What's the difference? I mean, he's your father, and, your fa- and you just said your father's dead. I mean, something right there don't make sense, sir. Oh, you know, I'm saying the Bible says, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in a nurture and admission of the Lord. You have a responsibility to train that young child, and you admit that you're taking him to a place that's not teaching all truth, and you're fine with that. You're you right, but you called him father. My father died before I was born. I'm sorry to hear that. So I, I, I don't see what this has to do with this. I'm saying if my if my father if my father was living, if my father were living, and he had not trained me up in the in the right way, then he would have been wrong. So what? I mean, I, that's what's the point? My point is, you're admitting that the, the problem is you admitted that you're teaching, you're, you're taking this child, you're taking this child to a place that doesn't teach the truth, and you're fine with it because he likes to go there. You, you're trying to blame this child because your father no. passed away. And didn't no, you. I'm blaming you. You're right. I'm blaming you for taking your child to a place that you know is teaching them error, and you're not doing anything about it because he likes to go there. You're supposed to be the adult here. Your father passed away. I'm sorry to hear that. Right? I don't know what that has to do with this. I just said he was my father. Well, I don't. What, what does that have to do with the conversation that we're having here? We're talking about you and your son, or your grandson. One for the other. It's all right for you to call him your father, but you're saying it's wrong for us. To say no, that, no, uh, no. That's not the point I'm making. Jesus said you pray to the Heavenly Father. Ain't our Heavenly Father Jesus' uh, Father, right? You don't pray to Jesus. That's my point. Not Jesus, you pray to the Father. We see, you already messed up. No. He prays. Listen. Hey, listen. Oh, listen, listen. I'm, I'm. He tells when he prays. Listen. He says, thank you, Father, for letting Jesus die on the cross. Or our okay, you said he's praying to Jesus. You said he... he, he, he for him down on, on the cross for our sins. You said he's, th- he's praying to Jesus. He, he, thanks, he, he thanks the Father. For okay. Son Jesus died on the cross. Okay, I I'm, I'm misunderstood. I'm sorry. Okay, listen, I've got to get off because I'm trying to finish up a few more points. And uh, I'm, I've only got about seven minutes left. All right? Okay, no problem. All right, I thank you for your call. Call again. All right. All right. Now, so friends, when you, I uh, just, I can't get over that. And I've talked to this, I know who this gentleman is now. And, uh, I mean, you're taking your children to a place that's teaching them error. You admit they're teaching them error. But now they're getting something a little good. Well, okay. You know, I, I guess. I'm taking them to a place that sells good hamburgers, but there's, there's rat poison in the hamburgers, but man, the burgers are sure good. Uh, this doesn't make sense to me. All right, all right. Now, what? So, which God are you serving here? Which God are you serving? Uh, what about this? The God of the church is not important. You know, th- there's individuals that will say the church is not important. I'm gonna try to get this one in, and then you'll turn right around, and there's a group that says. Uh, you know, church, your choice. Yes, hi. 
Uh, a lot of these people that are calling up, I don't say nothing bad about people that go to church, but I think you need to look within yourself and find what's good in your heart and go in your soul and find peace. That's because sweet. I've been to churches before, and I don't deny I, ha- I have faith in God and, and faith in Christ. And But, uh, you know, I think you just not find the goodness in your heart mm-hmm. and, and try to do what's right and mm-hmm. and do what you think is best for your children, mm-hmm. what's, what's good in your heart and good in your soul and, sure, and the values mm-hmm. and what you think is right for Absolutely. you and your children. I don't think all the answers are in church, in really- my belief. You can have peace and happiness and faith and all that at home, so you don't have to go to church to get all that. You can have peace and happiness and faith and all that at home, so you don't have to go to church to get all that. All right, so you can have peace, happiness, and faith, and all that stuff. You don't need to go to church. Now, if that's the case, what about this? What about this person that says any church will do? If uh, uh, this may not be going to play. If one church is just as good as another, then what do you say to these people that are saying, I don't have to go to any church? Is, Is that fine? I mean, what about the people that don't worship in any church? Is that a good enough church? Is the, is the anti-church, the non-church, is that good enough? And if it is, then why are you even going to church? See how it is, friends? And what happened is people are listening to their own reasoning, their own mind, and saying, well, I don't have to go to church, or I don't have to go to a particular church, or I don't have to worship God in a particular way. Who's telling them that? Whose God are they serving? They're serving themselves. They are their own God telling them that they don't need to worship in a particular way. But friends, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that the saved are in the church. Acts 2 verse 47, The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The church is the body of Christ. Ephesians 4 and verse 4. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And there's only one church and He's the Savior of the body. That means he's going to save the church. Now, friends, you cannot be saved outside the church that Christ built. You just can't do it. He built one church. It belongs to him, and the saved are all in that church. They're not in the Baptist church. They're not in the Methodist church. They're not in the Lutheran church. How do I know that? Because Christ died for his church. And you can say, well, I don't need the church. You're saying you don't need the body of Christ. Well, I don't need the church. You don't need the blood of Christ. Because the blood's what bought the church. If you say you don't need the church, or if you say any church will do, then you're saying any body will do. Any blood will do. See how it works? But the Bible clearly says there's only one body. It's the body of Christ. It is the church. He's the Savior of the body. And that's the church you need to be in order to be saved. Friends, it just doesn't get any plainer than that, but yet people come along and say, well, my God says any church will do. Well, your God is not reading out this book, and your God didn't write this book. The God that wrote this book says one church is the body of Christ, is the church of Christ, and the saved are in that church. And friends, that's, that's where we want to be. We want to help you, see? Now, if you're not, if you're not serving the, the true God, you're serving the God of this world. And the Bible says that God's going to bring vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of Christ, 2 Thessalonians 1.8. Friends, is that really where you want to be? Is that really where you want to be? Why not obey God and worship Him in spirit and truth? Come visit the Church of Christ. We meet at 250 Boulevard. And we'll be glad to study with you. All right, friends, I've got just a few minutes left. I want to uh, uh, remind you of a, TV, of a radio program. Sundays at 5 p.m. And friends, tonight, this is the last night that I'm going to be on WGSR, at least in the near future. Going to exclusively be on the radio, Rockingham County Radio 24.com. Again, if you're watching this, a lot of people are watching online. So you're right there. You can, you can go ahead if you're on Roku or whatever. You can still watch or still listen. Rockingham County Radio 24.com. There's going to be updates on uh, YouTube. We get that streaming as well. 
So a number of ways you still still hear a word from the Lord. It's just going to be on Sundays at 5 p.m. from now on. So set your calendars, mark it, mark it down, and here's the phone numbers. Here's the phone numbers, 336-427-9696 or 336-627-9563. Sundays at 5 p.m., Rockingham County Radio. If you could pick up 1490 uh, a.m., 1420 uh, a.m., you can hear it that way. I know there's folks almost in Danville that are listening on the radio, but you can get it online or you can download it on your phone, get the app on your phone, and you can uh, uh, hear us, watch us, listen to us that way. But, friends, uh, I've enjoyed being on, on television. I've enjoyed uh, this format. And not to say that we won't be back uh, sometime in the future, but right now, Sundays at 5 p.m. is where you can get a word from the Lord. So I hope that you will call in, let us know you're watching or listening. And until then, uh, God bless, and uh, we'll see you. Come visit us at 250 The Boulevard or be in touch with me, 276-340-2653. Until then, a word from the Lord, Sunday at 5 p.m. God bless. Have a good night.